Justin Stanix. <laughs> I'm Nanotronics Chief Revenue Officer, Matthew's company. Hugo and I work together at eBay, uh, and I'm an advisor to his company. I feel like I should disclose that to you before we get into the panel. Um, but for our panel, so first we have Patty Johnson, who is the founding editor of Art F City, which is a regular column in Artnet, uh, published by the New York Times, The Economist, New York Magazine, the first blogger to receive an art writer's grant from the Creative Capital Foundation, and has lectured about the intersection of art and the internet at Yale, Parsons, Rutgers, South by Southwest, and the Whitney Independent Study Program. Um, then we have Simon Dedeo, who's an assistant professor of social and decision sciences at Carnegie Mellon, uh, an external professor at the Santa Fe Institute, and runs the Laboratory for Social Minds at Indiana University, which studies the present and past of the human species to better understand its future. Uh, undergrad in astronomy and astrophysics at Harvard, master's in applied mathematics at Cambridge, PhD in astrophysical sciences at Princeton, and his research areas around applied logic and computational theory, uh, cognitive science, complex networks and systems, machine learning, and other. Hugo, uh, I think one of our resident, one of the few proper experts on artificial intelligence in the world, uh, founder and CEO of a company called Art Advisor, which brings in aesthetic intelligence to the art market, kind of creates a ranking of significance and potential of artists. Um, studied undergrad at MIT with Marvin Minsky, undeniably one of the fathers of artificial intelligence. Masters in engineering in AI at uh, MIT as well, and a PhD in taste science, but that's part of their science and media arts. Today, or the other day, a couple days ago, I realized I'd never looked at your Google Scholar, as long as I've known you, published more than 75 times and cited more than 4,000 times on the subject of AI. And some of Hugo's top most cited papers are, and this is a little bit of an indulgence for myself, so forgive me, but ConceptNet, which is a practical common sense reasoning toolkit. These are titles of papers. Another one, a model of textual effect sensing using real world knowledge, unraveling the taste fabric of social networks, Social Network Profiles as Taste Performances, and my favorite, a corpus-based approach to finding happiness, which we could probably have our own panel on. Um, and actually the thing that eBay bought, the interest map, harvesting social network profiles for recommendations, which public knowledge about a $100 million acquisition of eBay. Um, then we have Matthew, <laughs> my good friend and business partner. Uh, Matthew studied music and theater undergrad, and then a PhD in material science and applied physics. Chairs the board of Pioneer Works, uh, of, and also a board member of Bilty Jones Arnie Zane Dance Company, and uh, published a book of poetry and jazz piano. So it's a group of people that are obsessively interested in everything. Um, before the first question to the panel, I think something that's really important for the context of the panel is defining somewhat mundane terms, and that is subjective and objective, and uh, these are from the Oxford English Dictionary. So subjective is based or influenced by personal feelings, tastes, or opinions, which I think is germane to the creation and assessment of creative works and art. But in terms of AI, the, the second definition of that, or the sub-definition, is dependent on the mind or an individual's perception for its existence. Um, and I think we'll get into that in something Simon will speak to about an AI's perception of its existence. And for objective, it means not influenced by personal feelings or opinions in considering and representing facts, which is kind of the fundamental question of this panel. Can humans or AI be objective? And uh, you know, so that's not dependent on the mind for existence. So first, I want to ask everybody on the panel, what is art and what is AI? So in like 20 seconds <laughs> each, for each definition, what is art and what is AI? So we'll just go down the row. Uh, OK, shall I start then? Yeah. All right, well, uh, the art critic in the room will tell you that uh, art is whatever. If you say it's art, then it's art. Um, it doesn't really need to have a whiff of creativity for you to call it art. Uh, I wish you wouldn't do that if you're going to do it, but that's, uh, that's sort of the going um, definition. My definition of good art is something that uh, involves a, a kind of unique vision um, and uh, uh, creativity and innovation in, in uh, some way. And then the second question is, what is AI? Um, 
I'll just put a disclaimer out there that I am not an expert in AI. As I see AI, it's basically like Skynet. Uh, so, like, if it has a, a awareness and it sort of acts like um, it does in a movie, so it like learns and adapts to an environment um, that is constantly changing, then that would be my definition of AI. Limited as it is. <laughs> um, so I'll, I will give the answer from the cognitive sciences, but it's also a, a sort of a personal answer as well. Uh, I think Patty had something right, which is that art has a social aspect to it. Um, I don't know so much about that. What I would say about art that distinguishes it from engineering, like what makes new lab, what makes this amazing space, right, not art. Um, a lot of thinking goes into building an engineered system, but art differs from that because art is in fact thinking made concrete. And maybe one way to think of it is like art's like this kind of pill, right? So you take this pill and it gives you a series of thoughts that somebody else has constructed. And I think that's the fundamental thing that art has to do in order for it to work. But at the same time, I think there's, some, there's a lot to be said for this idea that art is basically what everybody decides to call art. And I think the reason there is that you, you, you can't give somebody a thought without a cultural context and a tradition for that to happen. And so there's, a, there's an aspect of that which is absolutely necessary. Um, the notion of artificial intelligence, what is artificial intelligence? I, this is, um, to me, there's no strict dividing line between natural intelligence and artificial intelligence. Um, when I was a physicist, I learned to make Feynman diagrams, right? These are these beautiful diagrams that you use to represent particle interactions. And in some sense, this was like an external computer that we could use that Richard Feynman had invented for us, and it was super, super powerful. And I don't really see a huge gulf between you know, Feynman teaching us to do this calculation in a really new, quick way, and a, a little microchip that helps me, you know, that breaks my car when I'm about to hit a truck. In fact, that's a lot simpler than what Feynman did. So I think there's a huge continuum here between, I think, artificial, the era of artificial intelligence. Skynet has been here for a long time, um, and probably going all the way back to the symbolic era. So I would say that defining artificial intelligence in contrast with natural intelligence is impossible. Um, so I think I agree mostly with what Simon and Patty have said. I would say that for me, AI is a moving target. It's something that we romantically want to believe that it's something humans can do that machines cannot. And the moment that machines can perform something well, and we all understand how it works, then it becomes not magic and therefore not AI anymore. And this has happened you know, a lot with basic text-to-speech, um, when that got good, good, um, I think people call it text-to-speech and not AI anymore. And so AI is like a romantic moving target of things. And now I think art, generative art is still AI, and I think that the new generation of AI technology that's based upon um, neural networks, uh, convolutional neural nets in particular, are very much magical, and they're impervious to full understanding because they're like, taking science and AI and moving it into a wet lab. You know, you're kind of growing a petri dish of, of um, perceptrons. And so I think in that way, um, there's gonna be a lot more AI that stays in the news because we can explain it. And it is somewhat magical or pathological. Um, and I think art is, is um, romantically, I think art is something that engages um, culture and engages us into a dialogue to talk about um, like things like what is art, what is culture. Um, and and the, the best art that I've seen uh, is extremely honest and causes us to question like even the act of beholding what is art. Um, and I think that um, realistically in the art market, art is whatever you call art. And the art market is very much, the contemporary art market is very much like 50,000 people who think they have taste, playing like Etch-a-Sketch, trying to figure out what art is, so. Uh, these guys are all wrong. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I don't think that art is whatever you call it. I don't think anybody can decide um, to create art and think that it's art. I think that there is good art and there's bad art. Um, I think that the, the, essence of this and the difficulty becomes on the art side 
is who is the judge of that. And sometimes it can take generations to judge what is good or what is bad. Um, it's during the process of creating that we have absolutely no idea, nor should we really consider that question of whether it's good or bad. We're not considering an audience. We're creating something. Now, the reason why this question of AI in art to me is interesting is that AI is by its nature different. Um, and I hate to speak about this in front of Hugo, who knows so much more about this than I do. Um, but from my understanding of AI, I actually think everything is sort of narrow AI, and we can talk about that if we want to get into that. But the basic idea of AI is that you're optimizing for something all the time. Um, you're creating something called the utility function. So the creator of the AI is saying what they want the AI to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Now the AI will have something and a way of going about it that you can't dig inside and understand what it did. But, if you, but you're knowing the question that you're asking. That is very different than the, neither, both the process of art, but especially the outcome of whether it's good art or bad art. So after this excellent demonstration of subjectivity, um, I, <laughs> You know, somebody once said to me that if you're defining an if you're building an artificial intelligence that optimizes for X, you had better be certain that the definition of the X includes everything that you love. Um, the person whose name I should remember and unfortunately do not, but um, to that point, can AI ever be objective? Um, and so I guess Hugo or Simon, maybe we'll start with Hugo and then follow up with Simon, can AI ever be built to be objective, or is it only a product of the subjective humans that trained it? Sure. Um, so I think we have to unpack like what objectivity is. Um, I happen to be agnostic as to what what objectivity is, and I think that objective objectivity is a word that describes something that most people agree with is objective, like math and physics. Um, and I think that part of what makes something what makes something amenable to being called objective is that most people can examine it and can s find nothing flagrant about it that is not objective. For example, if you put code into open source and you release it on GitHub and you let everyone look at it, it's an AI system, um, and everyone agrees that it's making judgments in a reasonable, un, like non-flagrantly biased manner, then it's much more likely to be perceived as objective, the outcome of that algorithm. Now, I think that where, where things get murky is a lot of AI is trending toward neural nets and CNNs, RNNs, and those things are really hard to introspect and to debug. You can't see how it works, and so it's very easy that um, it could encapsulate some you know, horrifying bias that if people could see that if that was actually a feature that everyone would think that it wasn't objective. I'm, just, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit about how I, how I teach my students and uh, how I teach them. We do a lot of work on the quantitative study of human behavior. And what I tell them is, look, we have some great mathematics that tells you how to know things, right? We have a theory about how to build beliefs about the world. And uh, we also have a theory about how you want things. Right? How the desires you have and how desires interact. And you have to put these two things together to figure out what somebody's going to do. If I want to know what, what Matthew or Hugo or Patty's going to do, I have to, I have to know what they know and I have to know what they want. And then I put those two together and then I get a whole thing that flows out the other side. And so there's this really exciting idea, right, that maybe we can actually get a hold of the truly objective by just forgetting what we want and just building models of how to know, right? And I think that's this feeling that maybe machines would be more objective than we are because we don't have to give them any desires, at least that's the feeling we have, that we can just say, go, go observe the world and tell us what you find. And, but I think Hugo is absolutely right, is that, of course, there's no way to do this, right? There's no transparent eyeball, right, that takes in everything. It's constantly, these machines are constantly throwing things out, things that either we said don't keep it or we gave it a certain set of constraints and it's gonna throw them out because it kind of figures out what we actually wanted. And then like a machine is like a, a baby and you have to instruct it, you have to give the algorithm like examples of, oh, this is true, this is not true, give them lots of examples. Mm -hmm. And in, in choosing your examples and curating your examples, you're biasing them, right, with that potentially. 
So there's, there's, I'm going to, since Margaret Minsky is now in my brain, because he's, he was your advisor, so I'm going to tell this is an old AI lab story, an AI koan, which you probably know. Um, so it's like a Zen koan, but for, from MIT. Uh, so it's more, it's even more aggressive. Um, so the story is there's a grad student, and he's building a neural network, and Marvin Minsky comes in, right? And Marvin Minsky is like, oh, hi, what, tell me what you're doing, right? I, I don't know what his voice sounded like. Tell me what you're doing, and the grad student says, oh, you is know. Is that I, it? Did you know, nail it? No. No, I can't do it. I'm not, probably not big enough. Um, but uh, Minsky, so, you know, the, the grad student says, oh, look, I, what I'm doing is I'm building this randomly programmed neural net to, to perceive objects. And Minsky says, well, why is it randomly, you know, why are you giving it random conditions? Why are you randomly programming it? And the grad student says, so it won't have any preconceptions. And then Minsky closes his eyes. And the grad student says, why are you closing your eyes? And Minsky says, so the room will be empty. And so I think the fundamental thing is even when we build machines that we think have no preconceptions, all we've done is made ourselves ignorant of what those preconceptions actually are. They're, they're still there. Okay, so there's a question I was going to ask later that I'm going to ask now. So is it possible for an AI subjectivity to be transparent or traceable or documentable or once you build this closed neural network is then that it's a black box unto itself, like the Google AIs that created their own language? Is it possible to reveal what feeds the subjectivity more so than a human, right? Because a lot of it is subconscious and you fail to realize what you're ignoring and what you're considering passively. Sure. I mean, the, uh, we've seen a lot of images from, from Google DeepMind, and they have, you know, some of the best n kind of neural nets trained on images in the world. And what's interesting is that they use it usually to run, when you run it forward, it takes an image you see on the web, and then it, it tags it or categorizes, like, this is a sunrise, this is a sunset, this is a desert, this is a picnic. But when you run that backwards, you get all these intermediate representations, which is like this pathological, you know, kind of dreaming dreamscape. And um, when, when you run it backwards, you, it's kind of entering debug mode. It's like, show me what's inside your head. Um, kind of like, um, like if you were to capture some uh, serial killers and you were to give them the war shot and they see like these weird things, you can kind of test their, their mind a little bit. So to a limited extent, you could figure out, you could debug or introspect even like a neural net. Professor DiDeo, do you have oh my God. Um, completely opposite Yeah, I mean, this is a, huge, this is a huge problem. Um, I had a graduate student I worked with, he's now um, at one of these tech companies. Um, and Will was really interested in this problem of identifying uh, tumors on an x-ray. And we talked a long time about the following condition, which is he was getting data from all these different hospitals. And um, he was training the algorithm to spot tumors, right? And so he had, you know, doctors would say, okay, this, there's a tumor in this image and there's not a tumor in this image. And so he was training the system. And we got really worried about the following problem, which is what if one of the hospitals had a slightly different x-ray machine, or it even just put the logo of the hospital in the corner of the x-ray, or it did something, it was slightly out of focus. And let's also say that a hospital had a higher rate of lung cancer then of course the algorithm could cheat, right? It could just say, oh, it looks like that's from, you know, um, I don't know, Mount Hillel, right? And Mount Hillel, like I can just, I can spot the x-ray characteristics from the machines at Mount Hillel. And uh, the guy probably has lung cancer because he's, he's getting scanned there. And of course, this is not what you want the machine to do. It's basically, you know, it's, it's not doing the thing you want. You want it to look for a spot on someone's lung, but actually it's looking in the corner to find the registration mark. And this turned out to be a huge problem. Right? We, we have a great deal of trouble figuring out why the machines are saying what they're saying. And of course, it becomes an even deeper problem you know, when it goes beyond identifying cats, but it goes to identifying you know, who are you going to pull over uh, for a random search. Right? Who are you going to pull over? But forgetting about you know, all these enormous consequences of dropping dead and so on due to AI, uh, we, had a, we had a conversation, um, you know, we had a conversation just about AI doing something right in design. And I thought that was so interesting, Simon, that you would, I, I was showing this off. You know, I was saying, look, there was this generative algorithm that got it right, that a human could have never done. It would have taken thousands of years, and humans still may not have done it. And you were questioning this idea of whether that, whether that was a positive thing or not. I'm, 
I'm interested if you could explore that a bit more. It gets a little closer, I think. So t t you have to help me here. What, 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 oh, never what was mind. this thing? No, 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 no. No, <laughs> you seriously, you yeah. guys, I have no idea what we're talking about anymore. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Can somebody catch me up to speed? I'm like, I'm a little confused about where we went from the, the question that was asked. Uh, I'm actually being serious. No, 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 no. You're looking at me like I'm totally crazy. No, no, I just, no. I, I mean, so, okay, so, so um, like somebody likes a painting, why do they like a painting, right? How do, you, how do you go about finding that out? And I think there's a similar question, right? Like the AI says, you know, that's a tumor, right? right. So how do, you, how do you get inside somebody's head when they're making a judgment? Maybe that's the right way to put this. Okay, and then what did that have to do with the, like the story that Hugo was telling? That I have a sort of similar like thing that 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 I worked on, right? Like I did um, a while back. I wrote a catalog essay for something called Emoji Dick. Emoji Dick was one of the first okay. Kickstarter projects um, that was funded. Fred Benison did it, and he basically hired a bunch of Amazon Turk workers to translate uh, Moby Dick into emojis. And he had three levels, so they went through, they translated the entire book. And then a couple years later, somebody from the Texas Biennial said, can you do a live performance? And I thought, what the hell am I gonna do? I'm an art critic. And, but then I was like, oh, you know, I got this book, Emoji Dick, why don't I read it, see what happens? So I read the emojis from Emoji Dick on, lo like on the radio live. Let me tell you what doesn't translate when you try to do it backwards. Like I have no idea what I was saying, like, I, like nothing. But it's the, anyway, the whole story sort of reminded me of your tag story about like, you know, like, going forward like we know it's on like the tags we can tag a sunset or whatever but then like when you run it backwards like there's a bunch of mud in between like what the hell does this have to do with the question that was asked <laughs> i mean like that was that was great right i thought that was great the actual <laughs> question though <laughs> yeah I mean, i'm I mean, going to let one of you answer that yeah well, I, I think the question is that what do we, so you could talk about subjectivity or objectivity, but there's also consciousness of what you're doing at any, at, at any point. And I think it, it ties, you know, our memories are something that are fading and flickering and not reliable. What if we have a machine that is such in, that, in this way? So if I go back and try to, to grasp a memory, I will be wrong. But, you know, but we feel that's human. You know, it's that, there's something okay about that. And great art can be created due to our imperfections. In fact, we celebrate our imperfections. Like in, in art, we often like look at, at an imperfection and then like we'll, we'll valorize that. Like right. as something that's, that's special about it because it's more unique. Yes. I'm, just, I'm, I'm just thinking about, right, so, you know, the artist, like, you know, why'd you draw that? It's like, you're, you ask me, you're an idiot, right? Like, I'm the, I'm the genius, I'll tell you what I draw. And it's a little bit how we treat our AIs, right? We, you know, we ask them to make decisions for us, generally, right now. I don't think there's a lot of this reverse engineering. We basically say, like, do this thing that we want, you did it, and we can't ask why. We can't ask what was the process by which you decided to do that thing. Right. H hence the reason I don't think we're anywhere near, back to the main point of this, I don't think we're anywhere near, nor should we want to be, to a point where AI, in this grand sense of AI, that has a kind of consciousness and objectivity ha to create art. Because we're, not, we're at the point with AI where we're asking questions. We're asking questions and we're giving something to optimize for and whatever goes on in, in between could be incredibly smart, it could be superhumanly smart. But we don't know those questions to ask of humans. That's where, that's where the sort of beauty of us creating art comes from. So I'm gonna use that to transition a little bit to another topic which is, and Patty, this question's for you. Is objectivity even a good thing or at all relevant when assessing uh, or making creative works. I mean, so much, particularly of contemporary and modern art, is about context. Um, and I mean, well, I'll say if there's an AI-related example, 
from some work that Hugo did at eBay, actually, that I happen to be familiar with, that, that where subjectivity becomes highly relevant in assessing things like coolness. It was a study that he did around brand coolness. But um, it, yeah, is that is objectivity? Is that even a positive trait, or is it so? Is the art world so driven by subjectivity? Well, we actually have a lot of arguments and debates about this at the office of, uh, about whether art is entirely subjective, which um, some of the critics at Art City um, entirely believe, and whether there's objectivity, which I actually tend to agree with, because I. Um, even though, as you said, within the contemporary world, context is everything. And um, so you really don't understand a work very well unless you understand the full context that surrounds it. But uh, you, having said that, like, as a critic, like, I feel like it's very important to be able to say, like, OK, I've looked at this. This is rendered well. This is not rendered very well. And then, you know, you take in the context of, like, okay, well, maybe this is Josh Smith and, like, his whole thing is, like, not, is subverting the system and, and, and that's part of it. But, um, you know, it's work like that that I can't stand. Like, I, I just, like, want to look at a nice <laughs> work of art. And that, I, and that doesn't mean, like, easy art. But it, it does mean that work that is not wholly reliant on context because like, you know, I, I guess I sort of, I was thinking about this the night before and I, I, like it's such an easy example that I didn't really want to get into it, but whatever, here we go. Like, it, like it, within like context, you could say that context influences everything, like two plus two equals four, but then like, well, what if we're not in the, in, you know, what if this is like reality one and reality three over there is like, that's not really how the, like, things work. Like within, you know, you have to have a, you know, a parameter and framework within which to evaluate things. Otherwise, you're doing nothing and art is entertainment and, and you know, there's no value. And that's what I'm really invested in. Cool, I, I agree with that. I mean, you know, that two plus two is kind of, I just think it's a, I, I think that the creation of art is a subjective experience almost, right? You, you, you don't, you, even if you set out with this sort of optimization that you're going to have some kind of social co commentary or something like this, um, the creation sort of removes you while you're creating from trying to be objective. If you start, to, if you try to be objective while you're doing it, it can be a problem to the art. Um, and, you know, I, I play jazz musician, I'm a jazz musician. So in jazz, it's especially true. I mean, I, um, you, you start playing poorly um, when, as soon as you start to analyze what you're doing in real time. However, as soon as it's over, I think that we start this process of figuring out if something is objectively good. Um, and the process starts with the artist looking back at it. So I'm not going to touch it anymore, but I'm thinking about it, and then a critic comes in and different audiences, and then generation after generation can go by without us even really knowing. But then you have something like, you know, Mendelssohn rediscovering Bach. You know, Bach was good in his time and recognized in his time, but then time went by and he wasn't again, and then Mendelssohn brought Bach back, and we still have Bach as pretty much understood as being objectively good. So this is a process that can go on forever. And that's sort of a beautiful, wonderful thing. It's why museums exist. It's, and I think it's why humans ex exist. To both create art in a kind of subjective way, and then to try to objectively analyze it for the rest of our lives. I totally agree with that. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just thinking about I mean, our natural instinct when we see a work of art is similar to our natural instinct when we see something really crazy happen on the street, right? Is we find somebody and ask them, did you see that too? And you know, what we do if we see something crazy on a street, like oh, the naked cowboy runs by or something, and you would turn to somebody and say, did you, did you just see what I saw? And when we do that, of course, what we're trying to do is get some objective sense to what's going on. We had some experience, what just happened? And I think that's what we do with art, right? In some sense, the sign that critics exist that departments of humanities exist is that we do feel that there's something that collectively we can get a handle on. 
it's uh, it's a very different. I mean, we we think of you know, there's one theory of what it means to be objective, which we get from the French, and it's a terrible theory, um, not because it's from the French, but they were the first, um, which is which was Descartes, right? Which is like, well, what I truly know is my experience. That's real, right? If I have like I see a blue square, it's that's definitely what's going on, and I understand from color theory that's not true, right? You can make a blue square from a red square. Not an expert on this, but yes, you can like definitely fool. Like, you can, yes. I mean, that's that's maybe extreme, right? Um, you can make a beige square from a yellow square. Right? It's more <laughs> like that. <laughs> uh, but so that's I mean, and it, that's wrong, right? Our immediate perceptions are totally processed; they're already processed. And I think what we do as as academics and scientists, but I think also as we do as art critics, is we're basically engaged in the same game, which is like, did you just see that? Yeah, but so even if so, maybe humans being at able to be fooled mm -hmm. you know we have all of these optical illusions and mm -hmm. mental illusions and mm -hmm. memory illusions and ai actually can probably be fooled less well, it's fooled differently but it's fooled differently right? yeah I think it's, it's so, fooled yeah. differently and i think in a way mm -hmm. that doesn't allow for the same type of creativity at least the way we think of ai now you know the, at least the way ai whether it's a deep learning network or reinforcement learning or i mean APL, we all the all the common Thing, does not do this. So we, we, we did a study of Poetry Magazine. So we scraped all 26,000 poems in Poetry Magazine. And 78 of them make it into the Norton Anthology of Poetry. This is work I did with a woman, Jenny Huang, who's a super genius under, undergrad at Indiana. And so Jenny and I worked on this. And it's, you know, we looked at essentially who are the, po who are the poets that survive the critics, right? Um, and so, you know, Wallace Stevens is in there and Gwendolyn Brooks is in there. and. I hate to say it, but you would be amazed by, you know, what it takes to make it into the canon writing, um, and it just always kills me to say this, what it takes to make it into the canon writing is like a white man versus writing as a black woman. And these are, there, are, there are totally different ways that you get into the canon. I don't think people are very aware of them. Right. And so in that sense, yeah, that, you know, we ran this through like the simplest possible logistic regressions that you could imagine. And what comes out the other side is stuff that's extremely surprising. And so even though those systems, they have no appreciation for poetry. Wallace Stevens is great, Gwendolyn Brooks is great, they're all great. But it was able to tell us something about their greatness that we, I think, were completely blind to. So I'm going to offer something that I think is the greatest case for why objectivity is important in assessing art. And that's from sort of a parallel path, which is some work that Hugo did when we were at eBay together. Um, he studied, amongst other things for us, brand coolness. And there were two internal product search, I guess machine learning AI kind of engines that I often used when looking at what we should be incubating and acquiring. Um, <laughs> very few of us leveraged it. But one was, uh, I forget, one was the brand coolness engine where you could just put in any brand of anything and it would assign a score for brand coolness. But the other was a demographic engine. So you could create a profile of like blue state, female, what she earns, if she's buying handbags or shoes or shirts or music, what is she, or bullion, gold bullion, what is she going for, what is he going for? And there was a lot of interesting things that came out of this research, uh, but one of the papers, one of the things that Hugo presented was at some conference in Norway or Finland, um, was about late adopters affecting brand coolness more than any other single factor of an established brand. That if too many uncool people became you know, flag-waving brand ambassadors or all-in wall-to-wall adopters of a brand, that it would drive away all of the people that made that brand cool. And when you think about the art market <laughs> and what goes from being a scarce asset at Gagosian to what becomes flooded at Sotheby's or worse yet, Christie's, um, depending on who sells, what auction house sells the art, depends on where those, how far those prices fall. You frowned like... I mean, um, it's just the, yeah. it's like the Red Sox versus the Yankees. I have no idea. Feels well, like you just so, something so that's something that a human would not necessarily see, but a human would sense, right? And we would take that to be a subjective sense that a person sees that these, peop these uncool people are adopting a brand late. But you built an AI that at eBay, we could tell that too many uncool people were going after a brand, and therefore it was the wrong... Well, for a lot of reasons, something bad was happening. So, I mean, do you think that that type of logic and what you built applies to things like art? 
Yeah, sure, it applies to art. Uh, the art market, like just to re re recapitulate like the question about subjectivity is that I think on the one hand there's objective, which most people agree, like math, physics, there's a right or wrong, and, and that there, if you don't agree then you're wrong. And then on the other hand is subjective, and the very end of subjective is like, you know, you do you, like you're being weird, but like that's very subjective, and they're like subjectivity is a euphemism for like, you're crazy. Um, and then in the middle somewhere is like a mixture, an admixture between subjective and objective. And, you know, I think Patty brought up a good point that, uh, you know, th that maybe the people that control things like taste in a field like art, um, the vanguard, people that judge whether or not something has critical um, merit, um, that these people, is on one hand, it's seen by outsiders as objective, like, oh, this person won the field medal in mathematics or won the Nobel Prize. But on the other hand, it's deeply subjective. It's just a very closed, what we call collective subjectivity of a few people. And that's the shared perception, shared values, shared taste of those people. And so the art market's very much, we wouldn't call it objective, we would call it collectively subjective among a certain vanguard or cabal of people, right? I was gonna follow up on that. So one of the, you talk about mathematics as an objective field and it's, mathematics has this very funny status, right? Because it's no longer about the real world, right? So the mathematics that we use in our AI engines and to do physics and to put things on Mars, it's basically from the 17th and 18th century, right? So mathematics after that point becomes increasingly detached from reality. And there's you know, far greater consensus in mathematics as to what constitutes a proved theorem than what constitutes a good piece of art. But uh, it does share this, this, this similar problem of taste. And so mathematicians are incredibly driven by if what's cool. If right? you don't believe in Cantor diagonalization, you can't win the Fields Medal. I mean, like it's right, like, exactly. And I, so that's, I mean, that's one example. You have these examples of these complete geniuses, <laughs> feedback, which we will come back to, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> feedback is is part it's of that this. diagonalization. Whoa, of yeah. The audio. No, uh -huh. nobody talk about undecidability. Um, but uh, so there's a great example of something that became completely uncool, which is many techie people probably know about the proof of the four color theorem. So the four color theorem says that you cannot color a map, um, or you need at least four colors to color like a regular map, right? So that no two countries on the map have, have, have the same color, right? So that you can make distinctions. And it seems like this shouldn't be possible and you draw diagrams and it turns out it is, and, but no one could prove it. Um, that you only needed four colors. You couldn't do it with three, but five was too many. Uh, no one could prove it, and then finally they just got a computer to check all of the possible answers. And it's like, you know, 100,000 answers the machine had to check. And so in a sense, the four color theorem was proved. And all of these mathematicians who had worked on the four color theorem got really upset because they said, now you've made it uncool. Nobody will ever work in this field again. No one will try to find a better proof. Nobody will work on this anymore because you've just like, the least cool person in the room, aka the computer scientist, has come in and solved the problem. So that's like, the, that's like me buying Louis Vuitton or something. At that point, it's over, right? That was one of the brands Hugo studied. Okay, well, hold on. Let's yeah. not, let's okay, not out any brands. Let's not yeah, out any brands. No, brand. sorry. What? Like, I yeah. don't. Don't short. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't sh don't long no short. Yeah. No. Um, no, but to, br to bring it back to, to, to the, the taste thing, there is this question, can you find objectively good taste? And I think you can find statistically objectively good taste. And what that means is you can find statistically objectively bad taste, poor taste, um, as in, so suppose you design a, you know, a little experiment where, where you have to believe, in order to, to run this experiment, you have to believe this, this assumption. You have to assume that things like brands and that information is unevenly distributed in the world about taste and that the first people to know about something cool are probably cooler than the last people to know about it, right? So the first person could be like someone in Bushwick and the last person could be my mom, right? And so if you believe that statistically some people are just always closer to the first person, the early adopter, and some people are statistically always closer to the last person, and then you can, you can you run machine learning against any kind of metric like, um, you look at all the brands that succeeded and then you go back early in time and say, who found out about these brands first? And you look at the fact that these certain people you can identify statistically as always 
being the first to know about something cool, something that explodes later on. And sometimes they're the first person to also leave a brand, not just adopt it. But once you identify people with statistically objectively good taste and statistically objectively bad taste, then you can start to characterize brands. You can also do this for artwork and anything else. I was, you know, Hugo used to sit near one of the entrances to the eBay workspace in New York, and everybody would have a really bad day when they'd walk through the, he was like right by this one door that we all used to be like, will you tell me all the things that you're wearing? And he'd just like run it through this brand engine and let them know what the coolness score that he assigned to it was. And that was really interesting experience, yeah, what I thought of. Hugo is getting dangerously close to not being human. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is, this is, I, mean, I think it's, I, I think that this makes complete sense for brands. It makes complete yeah. sense for fashion. It makes complete sense even for design. Now, am I being quaint to think that art is something different? Um, I don't think so. Um, and I, I think that it is just, I, I think that those, the, the, the time scale and the way that we judge things, even statistically, we wouldn't even know what time scale to judge it on. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just too hard to judge taste in its own time when it comes to art. And it has to a lot do with what you're optimizing for when you're creating art. You're not trying to create the coolest art. You're not even, you don't even know that you're trying to create the best art you may just end up doing it. And it's, it, the, the goals are completely different. So I, I, d I don't think that, you know, you may be able to take the last, you know, since a cave painting and start to statistically analyze everything that you could possibly look at since the first cave paintings through Michelangelo, you know, th through Jeff Koons, but, it do but you, it's really hard then to not have so much jitter that we don't understand. See, it. now I think that's a really interesting point that I hadn't thought of. When you talk about the cave paintings and like the innate needs of humans to be creative, we trained, you know, this, these, art, these early art images, early quote unquote, generated by AI, um, they're not as, these simple outlines, of, right, of like Lascaux or whatever else of the cave paintings. And so it shows <laughs> how uh, subjective uh, brain and deep dream are because really if it was an organic evolution of art created by machines, it should probably be something drop dead simple and geometric and minimalist in a way that none of these things that we're seeing. And That's then- true, maybe these are more subjective than a human artist. Well, to Patty's point, when you say like art is not entertainment, you know, these things are selling for like thousands of dollars. Google is selling these, I think, fairly awful trapper keeper, wrapper pieces of digital construction um, for thousands of dollars, but it's art as entertainment. The, the part, it lacks the context of subjectivity. What's interesting of it is about the baseline story that it was generated by an AI, and that alone is entertaining. Um, so, you know, one of the things Matthew and I are asked, not in this venue, or at least not tonight, um, is about, you know, we replace humans looking, our company replaces humans looking at things in factories, and actually the selling point of our machines are that they're objective and not subjective, and it removes the variation of human to human. So this is not an, a question or a problem that we have to address. Um, but Matthew always says that he believes, you know, and people are like, oh, what happens when we automate the workers? and we both say this, that it's actually arts are the answer to automation. If we are all, you know, that automation, that the post-work economy and universal basic income is the ultimate promise of technology. You know, technology has only given us more work to do and extended the working hours and not reduced it. And so in this post-automation world, it's, is this the thing in a, a Bill T. Jones board meeting? It's like, you know, nobody can dance like Bill T. Jones. Nobody can create a painting, be it like Rothko or Luke Toymans, that's like much more, you know, literal and figurative, um, or Raymond Pettibone, it's, is this, is actually art, be it the true Turing test? Like if you can convincingly, even if you look at these, and this is a problem I think in and of itself, that there's a clear signature, right, of this work, that you can tell, I mean, certainly it's a human plus a machine at least, but even if you look at all of these, like wow, okay, I can see that there is, you know, the Google AI has a certain aesthetic style. And so if Facebook suddenly starts creating an AI that creates art, it might look a lot different, but I'm willing to bet that there's a visual signature, an aesthetic signature that belongs to it much the way this, frankly, garbage has a signature. 
or in my opinion, garbage has a signature. Um, is that the answer to what happens when technology can replicate everything, including leading, reading and parsing legal briefs? Um, and so that's kind of like my last question before we open it up to the audience. So, so, I mean, what do you, is, do you get it? Yeah. Sure, so the Turing test, for those who don't know, it's, <laughs> this is actually, so it's, um, you know, Alan Turing, the computer scientist, kind of first only to Marvin Minsky. Um, it's, can a machine convincingly replicate a human in conversation? Can it trick you into believing that this machine is a human? And one of the things we talked about in the pre-panel talk was, you know, in a lot of websites now, when you sign up or signing up for something or trying to transact or even go to help, there's a little chat window. It's like, hi, can I help you? And you're like, yeah, I need whatever, right? Password or credit card or account. And the beginning of that is often an automated bot and you get put into a queue that then a human then picks it up. <laughs> to my point, and even to Matthews, and he and I deal with a lot of people in Silicon Valley on text chat message, and it's like, wow, you know, this could maybe be a bot, but I know that I'm talking to a human. Or when you're dealing with these customer support, it's true. Or when you're dealing with these customer support issues, you're like, at what point have I been handed over to somebody that's using a texted script, right? And it's, and it's actually hard to know when you go from bot to human, and so maybe that Turing line has been blurred, but ultimately it's, you're interacting with a robot, or you're interacting, you know, you know, but actually it's hard to believe that it's a bot. And so that's the Turing test. And so the, to the point of speech to text, where he goes like, well, the magic of that has gone out. A bot having semantic capabilities, having linguistic and conversant robustness is something that we've normalized. Much like, a, you know, an AI having the ability to operate a vehicle or a plane, we've normalized. And I mean, so if we're looking at the Turing test as driving a car a Turing test, I don't think anybody actually says that. It's about being able to fool a human. But if a human from 1960 was driving on a road full of autonomous vehicles with a dummy in it, would they know? Probably not. So we've probably already, I think, I guess, reached that point. But um, when you look at this, a machine is very clearly involved, and it's that. Can you fool someone visually with art that a machine, is that the ultimate, much like it's Hugo, so when we were talking about why he started Art Advisor and because he studied taste for a decade, one of the most published people in the world on the subject, maybe the most published person in the world on the subject, he said, you know, art is the holy grail of taste, is what he said to me once. And, you know, maybe that's a very subjective viewpoint. Um, in terms of creation, is art the holy grail of creation? You know, are the creative works, music, visual arts? So if, if a human can look at something and say, there's no way a machine sculpted that or made that, I mean, is that, is that kind of the ultimate achievement of technology, of AI? And, and as a second part to that is, is that the answer to what people will fill their days with when humans are doing, when uh, machines are doing all of our work? Sorry, this is it's like, a, it's a really, well, it's just such a complicated question. There's like so many layers to it, like, you know, but I think like, it, I, I mean, I think my sort of the reflex that I had was like, you know, does this, will this turn our entire, like, if everything gets automated, does that mean that art is just entertainment and like are, and, and do we, and, and I guess it goes back to what we want from art, which, um, you know, you had talked about it at the beginning, which it seems to be um, at the crux of all this. If art is sort of no different than, um, you know, what we do in our pastime to, uh, you know, maybe we go to a restaurant, then we go to a museum, and that's how we spend our time. And that, that actually is how art functions a lot of the time. Like, I think there's like a certain amount of mythologizing about art that like, it has this higher purpose, it teaches us all these like, new ways of thinking. And it's true, it does do some of those things. And like, but can, will a machine be able to do that? Like. I have no idea. Like I, I like I I hope so, but like I think the thing is is that we evaluate like there at a certain point we had been talking about history and like 
the how art like um, like when you're making art, you don't really know it. You, you can't sort of evaluate objectively what it's going to be and and what its value is. And once it's done, you can do that. But you know, there's like there's almost like too much of a history to know like what's going to happen afterwards and like where it's going to land and like. Um, I guess where I'm going with this is that like uh, it's we'll never know like what's what's we're constantly reevaluating the value of art um, and that's based on context what's relevant to us right now like you know how long is Andy Warhol going to be relevant to us like I hope not forever like he's just everywhere and like there's a sort of a limited amount that he's going to be able to say like a hundred years from now, like how much is a, like can we make something that's artificially intelligent, like how is it going to know what's valuable to us a hundred years from now? It's, it never will, in my opinion. Sorry, do you have an answer to how an AI will know what's valuable a hundred years from now? You don't have a direct answer to that, but I just have one. So I just want to ask Patty, Sorry, I just want to ask Patty one direct question here on this. So when we talk about what, a, what art AI can make, think about the recent Michael Friedel show at Zorner. You know, love the gallery and I'm okay on Michael's work, but it was, you know, those images of skeletal uh, canines wrapped in a Blick art bag <laughs> on that really rasterized background. That to me seems like something an AI could do. Now, I don't think it's like the apex of contemporary art, but that construct seems like an assemblage that an AI could kind of like gather together and bundle in some different kind of way. Um, I don't, I, I guess that's just like a point to consider when you say we don't know. Well, I don't think we know any more one way or, or, or the other. And when you talk about art as entertainment, I mean, that's kind of plucking one example out of many. I mean. Do, is that just as much a construct of being fed in a sample set that yields these type of images as, um, as, as anything else? Is that the point where it's become this appropriation? And this is more of a statement about like where the art world is. Is it at this place of so much subjectivity and where it's an appropriation and regurgitation of what triggers collectors and the market more so? And that is something that I think a machine would be fundamentally best at. And so how much of the best art that we see is really just responding to what people will buy. You know, I remember an artist whose dealer, good dealer, she was like, you know, this guy, he said, don't make brown art because people don't like buying brown art because it reminds them of shit. And like, that's an observation of just an art dealer. But so, yeah, you, you maybe don't have to respond. Wait, what, what was the question again? I think Do you, you think that modern art has become such a product of what the market will respond to? As an art critic of contemporary art, do you think that the, the art that moves in the art world, do you think it is so directly responding to and pandering to the market that it might as well be a machine that is doing it? In, in not every case, but in a lot, right? I think more things are the exception to the, uh, uh, or, or conforming to the rule than the exception to the rule. I mean, I think this does get outside of the AI question a little bit because within the art world, there are different different stratas, right? So there's certainly art that responds to specifically to the market, and that, um, and or, or should I say, artists who respond specifically to the artists and the, uh, to to the market, and that you know may not be the artist's fault. Like sometimes, you know, you get an artist will get stuck um, due to demand and um, you know, they have to make a living too, and, and these things happen. Then there is a certain strata of the art world that is uh, very much looking to be within, within the art market. And so a lot of the art that gets made, like, has a response to that. And then there's, like, an entire media um, kind of uh, environment that I think uh, is overly focused on work that uh, sells because that there's a certain um, spectacle to that. But then there's like an entire um, other kind of strata 
um, there's sort of a, there's an academic strata where there's like, you know, you can go to uh, college to college and show in those um, exhibition spaces. You don't get that much press. Um, it tends to be more installation um, oriented and that's like a different world. Then there's the artist run world. You know, that world tends to have, I mean, sort of more of a, a hip factor to it. Um, and tends to respond, like the work that gets made is very often a reflection of economic conditions. So like, I'm an artist, I can only afford a tiny space, so I'm gonna make these tiny paintings because that's all I can do. Or I don't have a studio at all because I can't afford a space, so I'm gonna make all of my work on my laptop so it looks like something else. So like the economic conditions and the, the conditions of the, the sort of world in general very much influence what gets made and how. And of course right now, like I see all kinds of artists who don't make anything because they're terrified of the political environment. And then on top of all that, I guess, you know, I was talking to an artist uh, yesterday, Deborah Cass, who's teaching at Yale, and she said that she stopped teaching about five years ago because she said at around in 2011, 2010, she noticed that artists no longer cared about history. Like in the, in the undergraduate level. And that that became an issue for her because she felt like she, it wasn't her job to make them care about history. Um, and then, so that of course informs art making as well. How that applies to AI, I, I would sort of be at a stretch to, to connect that, but that's sort of, that's a general um, overview of the strat, like different stratas in your world. No, so this is, I, it's, Sorry, I it's, piggyback. No, it, I mean, it's, it's fascinating to see people who actually live in this world talk, right? Um, uh, because from my point of view, right, the technology's always been with us, right? It wasn't that somehow we were making art in this natural way, like painting ourselves in woad and throwing ourselves at canvases. And then in 1950, they built a computer and then everything changed, right? We've been using artificial, you know, aids to produce art for you know, thousands of years, right? So when these guys in the Renaissance, right, make the camera obscure and drill a little hole in the wall and just trace out the images that are projected, they're using technology, right? When somebody invents perspective drawing, when somebody says, okay, you can have a vanishing point, it's an integer number between like one and four and don't go higher, that's a, that's a form of technology, right? Just as much as like, here's how to write Python code. And so in, in, in one sense, right, the, the tech, we've always had this problem of to what extent is a technical device, you know, telling us more about ourselves or telling us more about this awful thing we've just created, right? And so generally what happens is we hated it first, right? Because it's new and, you know, these perspective things are just totally, you know, ahistorical and, and and you know, harmful to our humanity, and we should paint like we used to with like eggshells or whatever. Um, and then at some point, we 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 learn to accept it, and we develop taste, right? And then at some point, we're going to sit around, and I don't think it'll look exactly like this. But to me, the the era when machines help us create, I mean, it's a, it's already here, and b, I mean, what we're really talking about is, is a machine going to sit down and and help us create like on a screen? I mean, we've had Photoshop for how long? Um, there's something else that you guys are hitting on, right, which is this awful thing. What you say about the art world is what we say about the scientific world, right? It's like, look, there's some scientists and they write these sexy papers and they get into nature. I hope this is not on tape record. They get into nature and science. They get all these it brands. Is, just so you know. It's okay. My friends won't read it. And then I'm not talking about you guys, my friends. But it's like, oh, yeah, like, that's a great sexy paper, you know, like, it's like, what is it, you know? And I'm just about to say the name of a paper written by a good friend of mine, so I will stop here. Um, and What's so, the name uh, of the paper? <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk after. Um, uh, I really want to say it. Um, but so everything you say is what we say as well. I think an AI thing. would cite the name of the paper. The AI just, would the know. The AI would be transparent. They enough. would know about it. But I have to conceal because I have desires to thrive after this panel's over. 
But so everything that you say, right, is, is, is exactly what we say, right? We're like, you know, look, there are these scientists who are really concerned about the market. And then, you know, so for example, a friend of ours, I say Matthew and I, um, he got this really prestigious job at Harvard, right? And then he had to do all this stuff to keep that job that was not as good as the science he was doing before, right? I don't know if you ever have this paradigm, like the artist gets really good and then to stay in the Gagosian or whatever, right? they have to like do something else. Or they have to, they either have to keep doing the same thing they did, right? Play, you know, um, Freebird again. So, so it's, it's funny that these sound so similar, but of course in science, we think of science as super objective, right? And so maybe this is also a clue, like the very fact that you guys are saying, can we hack the system, right? And I feel like this is one of the things you're thinking of. Can we, can we make art that's gonna get really successful, right? Scientists sit around and think this, not me, but some scientists sit around and say, okay, what would be the killer thing, right? Like deep learning plus like racism, yes. All right, that'll totally make, you know, the front cover of nature. And so, you know, I think the, the, the fact that we, there is taste in art, that it could even be hacked or predicted, which I think is something that you guys are thinking about, I don't think that detracts at all from the fact that art is this, and now I get to say it, right, this totally objective process that is like real, that's about thinking in the world, that has structure, that has meaning, and it's not simply what other people say, although what other people say does matter. I think these are completely consistent. So I think, just to be unambiguous, to answer the question is, can AI make objectively good art? Yes, hell yes, for sure, no doubt. Uh, this has been happening in every other domain. Art is just sort of the acme of domains in, in taste and, and context. I was the acme of context domains. And like 10 years ago, I made this system called the Synesthetic Cookbook. And what it does is it, it was an AI system that learned how to make food, so it knew basic kitchen chemistry, knew what things were good together, and then it mined like, you know, hundreds of thousands of recipes, and it could figure, it could generate arbitrary new recipes. So you you give it a name like demoniacal potato salad or ceremonious ice cream, and it would just write the recipes for you. And so the New York Times, sorry, the LA Times did a chef's profile on this AI system. It's 10 years ago, 11 years ago. And they said, okay, well, we usually, when we print a chef's profile for a person, we usually clip two, we ask the chef for two recipes to print. We, we make it in our test kitchen and whatnot. And because people collect these clippings of recipes. So I said, okay, fine, give me some keywords. They gave me some keywords and I generated hundreds of thousands of recipes that have never been made on earth before. And they picked two of them, I don't know how. Uh, cooked them in the test kitchen, and I got a bunch of fan mail about like, oh my god, I made this amazing food. This is so good. And I said, I've never made it, you know. So I think it's definitely very possible. And also, instead of seeing pure AI, you're much more likely to, uh, you know, to see what I think Simon's alluding to, which is AI human collaboration, cyborgs, right? Marshall McLuhan said that technology is just an extension of man. And so, you know, it's very likely that we will see humans and AI working intimately to build art that humans are really good at editing and finding good taste in, and machines are really good at combinatorially exploding the space of possibilities. So that's definitely gonna happen, and it's probably already happening that we just haven't seen. Can I just jump in there? This is a very simple example, I think, of what you're saying. So people have said the, the quality or the, 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 the sort of Professionalism of an amateur photographer has gone through the roof because the iPhone or these digital cameras have made the iteration loop so fast, right? So you can, you can take a picture, judge it, retake it on a timescale that's much faster than it used to be when we had film camera. And I mean, in some sense, that's, it seems to me a simple example of how a mostly unintelligent machine is already enabling this kind of rapid acceleration of, of, of quality. Yeah, we're, we're adapting to it too. Like, you know, like, I remember like five, 10 years ago, people used to think that the future of search engines was you speak a sentence and then it finds the thing on the internet. But no, actually people adapt to using keywords much better than machines adapt to the other way around. So we'll find the interface with AI where we can create these very, very novel forms. So, wait, sorry to interrupt, but just like with the, with the magic recipe thing that you did, right? Like the purpose of like creating recipes is to eat, right? Like you just wanna have some good food. Um, with art, like what do you see that like the purpose is beyond like 
Because to my mind, you'd want like something that's sort of beyond something that it's it's not it, like it's not rocket science to figure out like what things are going to look together, like look good together. You, I'm I'm sure there is an AI that that could do that, but like you know, it seems like food has a very basic purpose where like. Um, art, like the sort of purpose of it, is a moving target. So how do how do you kind of account for that? I mean, I think that probably overstates like the grandiosity of art, and it understates the grandiosity of food. But I think the <laughs> well, but I think to make I think a point. I think yeah, I think there's different fitness functions in art. And sorry, one of my favorite. <laughs> Sorry, one of my one of my favorite um, metaphors for the art world is by Sarah Thornton, who uh, was I think arts editor at The Economist, and um, she did an ethnography of the art world, wrote a book called Seven Days in the Art World, and she conveys this metaphor which I love, which is the art world is like a western movie that you know there are the cowboys and the sheriffs and you know the 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 harlots, and there's like all different cast of characters. You know there are people in the art world that just are hyping art and want to make money. There's people in the art world that just want something kind of to explain, uh, you know, uh, philosophy of life. There are different fitness functions, and you can build artwork against any fitness function that you so choose. Yeah. But I, I don't think there's any given moment where all the fitness functions are collapsed into one when we call that art. I actually think this goes back to your original question. You know, the two parts of this: the Turing test. Certainly. You're right, there'll be something indistinguishable to us here that we'll be able to look at that, it, that we won't be a good judge of that. You know, we're not, even that good, we're not even that good of a judge at what's good art at all the times either. What's I think more interesting is this post-work future in a sense. Mm -hmm. Will we, will our, what is our purpose? Um, it can be a hybrid, absolutely. I agree with all, all of this that you guys have said with this. But I, I do think about trying to automate everything in life that is basically misery. And art and science, to me, are not misery. So discovery is something that is somehow baked into me for whatever reason. I want to discover something new. I also want to create something new. Now, it doesn't mean that I will make a new discovery that's of any value at all, whether it's with the help of a machine or without the help of a machine. Uh, it doesn't mean that I will make good art. But doing that, may be all that's left for us eventually. Mm -hmm. And that m will be great. Maybe all we're creating is entertainment and that only a very few are creating good art. And, and the same thing goes with discovery and science. Mo many may just be looking out into the stars and coming up with ideas and most will be wrong, but somebody will discover something. Then we will have gotten rid of everything else and discovered what it really was to be human. Well, yeah, thank you. Well, thanks everybody for sitting through this.